next uh, invited speaker is uh, Nancy Professor uh, Burnham from uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. She's the Associate Professor in Physics and Biomedical Engineering. And uh, she does a lot of work with AFM, obviously. So the, uh, she, the title of her talk is Complex Polymer Beneath Your Feet. Thank you for making it. So good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. I just drove over from WPI, where I, I had class until 11 o'clock. And then I had students to talk to. And now I get to finally relax and, and talk to you. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the different research areas that I've been involved with of late. And they occupy um, several different uh, collaborations with Clark University, also in Worcester, Molecular Vista in uh, Santa Clara, and Aramco, which is based in Houston in this country, and also um, has a research lab in Boston where they focus on computational modeling and nanotechnology. So you see lots of, of people there who, who helped out with this. And um, so believe me, I didn't do this all by myself. All right. So uh, despite great advances in technology, uh, you hear a lot of news, both good and and nervous about Tesla recently. And um, they're, they're making great strides in renewable energy. But um, I am still very happy to have a car that is run by fossil fuel. It got me over here quite reliably. And, and I heat my house with natural gas. And so I think there are going to be some decades left where we need um, fossil fuels. And as, you know, as I was driving and swerving to avoid potholes, I was thinking, wow, I'm going to this great uh, meeting on nanotechnology, and we can make iPhones that have 25 nanometer gate widths, but I'm still driving over potholes. And, and can't we make a pothole, you know, can't we make our roads better? And, um, understand those, uh, that material and engineering aspects better. And you see the numbers on the right here, they um, really add up to some hundreds of dollars per person um, in the United States uh, because of vehicle damage, because of potholes. So uh, these are the kinds of things I'm interested in, how to make better roads, how to uh, extract oil more efficiently such that we can lower the infrastructure and it's the infrastructure that really causes the environmental risks uh, associated with uh, oil production. All right, so the subtitle of my talk is How Atomic Force Microscopy, AFM, contributes to more efficient oil extraction and improved infrastructure. So we have two main topic areas, the complex polymers <coughs> underground that become oil and gas. Where are they? What are their properties? How can oil be more efficiently extracted? And then after the oil is extracted, the complex polymers above ground, i.e., can you make a better road? So first, let's dive underground. And I want to show you the, the basic construction of the organic matter in a <coughs> shale. Um, these are white light micrographs. And the light gray areas are um, this one, that one. The light gray areas, uh, these bands, these are the squished plants and bugs and dinosaurs that are have been turning very slowly into oil and gas through the high pressures underground and the high temperatures underground. So we're very, very slowly cooking the organic matter and turning it to oil and gas. So the scale bar bars there are 50 microns and the, the very bright um, dots are iron, sul iron sulfide. So what you can do, 
of course, is use AFM to investigate the topography and mechanical properties of, of shale. And here are some AFM images, the height and, and error and elastic modulus um, taken by vibrating the cantilever uh, at about a kilohertz and doing a, a real-time fit of the force curve to um, the Deryag and Mueller Toporov uh, model for indentation. And you see that um, we've got moduli running from uh, a couple of gigapascals up to 100 gigapascals. And so those of you who have done this kind of thing will realize that, oh, that must be a very stiff cantilever. And the answer is yes, these are diamond-coated 200 net newton per meter um, cantilevers in order to indent such st stiff material. The iron pyrites here, um, they go up to about 100 gigapascal. The, the rock matrix is about 70 gigapascal, and the organic matter is um, 10, 10 or, or 20 gigapascal or so. Um, so, so that's one example where you can just um, study a rock. And before I went on sabbatical with a Ramco a few years ago, I'd never thought of rocks as nanomaterials, but now I do. Okay. Um, so another thing you can do is combine atomic force microscopy with infrared spectroscopy and uh, some molecular vista in Santa Clara was, was kind to help us a little bit with that because if you look at the topo AFM image, you can't tell what the different constituents are. And I have to admit this um, modulus measurement is rather slow, so can you do something more, more quickly? And you can, um, the molecular vista has a clever way of doing infrared spectroscopy at the same time you're doing AFM. And so at the same time we're collecting the topo data, uh, we can do an IR spectrum at each point, and that only takes um, 45 minutes um, to get about a gigabyte worth of data, a sp uh, IR spectrum at each of 256 by 256. That's 65,536 uh, points. And then you can use the software to um, cut and slice your information as, as you will. And this green band here is associated with uh, quartz. And you can turn that into a map, which is this um, figure D here. Um, and then this red band here corresponds to organic matter. You make that a map, and that becomes figure E. And so you can see which parts of figure A are, are rock and which part is, is organic matter. So um, that's quite uh, exciting for um, the people who work in the oil and gas industry because um, they're, they're fairly uh, traditional in terms of Oh, it's, it's you have a, a diamond drill bit and you dig down and <coughs> out comes your oil, right? So, um, so that's neat to be able to, to help them in this way. All right, so, um, so those are, are quick points. Um, uh, now here I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, more detail ab about one of the projects I've done with Aramco. And the point here is, once again, it, well, it's really ironic that I ended up working for the world's largest oil company because I am very much an environmentalist. Um, um, but I do realize that it's going to be 20, 30 more years, even under the most optimistic forecasts before we can move away from fossil fuels. So one of the amazing things I, 
I learned on my sabbatical in the 15, 16 academic year is when you uh, drill down, um, there's usually a sort of a gush of oil coming out at, and, and that gush corresponds to 10 to 25 percent of the stuff that's down there. Then you have to work pretty hard to get uh, 10 or 20 percent more. So in general, you only get out less than half of the oil down there, right? And so if we could be more clever about understanding where oil is and actually how it flows through the reservoir, it's not just sitting there in a big lake under a salt dome, it is in little pores and fissures, like kind of like water in a sponge. So if we can understand the, the reservoir better, we can get more oil out with less infrastructure. That means both lower cost and lower environmental risk. Okay. So uh, I want you all to understand what a res reservoir and oil field looks like. Um, there's not just one well, there are multiple wells. Uh, there's typically a production well, and around the production well are um, injection wells where you are pumping in water or maybe seawater or maybe foam to try and force the oil towards the production well. And if you can do that, um, you have to make sort of strategic decisions about where you place your wells. They're very, very expensive. And how can you make decisions like that when what you've got underground is, is fairly complex and it's hard to map? And so how can you best choose a site for a well or understand the fluid flow? Well, people have come up with all sorts of different ideas. On the left here are sort of smart nanoparticles where the chemistry of them is such that as they go buy some oil, they'll drop some of their constituent material. And then if you're lucky enough to, to detect them in a nearby well, you can check their chemistry and see if some of that chemistry has, has stuck on the oil, and so therefore, if it has, then you can say, oh, there's a lot of oil in, in this area here between where I injected them and where I detected them. And then another approach is to say, I'm going to make a very sophisticated nanoparticle that has its own fluorescent spectrum, and then for each well in an oil field, I will inject a um, particular type of nanoparticle that has, has its own um, spectral fingerprint, such that when they come up and you detect them, um, you can say, oh, this nanoparticle came from well A or from well D or well, well C. Um, and so that way you understand which way uh, the oil is flowing underground as you're extracting it. So if you do that, then one thing you have to worry about is are the nanoparticles you're injecting, are they sticking to rock walls or are they coagulating or um, what are they doing down there? Because um, the rock, of course, has its chemistry and we've got oil, we've also got brine, we've also got water. Uh, if you're injecting seawater, you have that too. So, so it's, um, what people are doing is um, they're finding that a nanoparticle coated with a dextran-like molecule works quite well under all of these uh, different chemical environments. And, and so what I want you to notice here 
is that the current nanoparticle coating is um, has got a lot of o OH bonds. Okay, so we remember that for the next part, and the next part is the following. We have a hypothesis, and that hypothesis is that if you take seawater and you inject, you add some calcium to it, that will lower the adhesion between these OH bonds and rock walls. Okay, so we're gonna study that in a fundamental way and we're going to say my AFM tip is like one of these nanoparticles we're injecting down. And of course I can functionalize the AFM tip. And I'm going to say that calcite is like the rock. Okay? And as, as, because this is a SPM conference, I'm sure you all know that you can do adhesion measurements with atomic force microscopy. And so our hypothesis is that the addition of calcium to seawater, which is a common recovery fluid, will reduce the adhesion of nanoparticles. And we're, we're substituting the um, AFM tip as a nanoparticle to carbonate rocks, um, calcium, calcite, in our lab experiment, via the saturation of OH groups. So here are typical AFM data. We did 32 by 32 in, uh, point adhesion maps over 500 nanometers. And you can see the typical force curve behavior with the adhesion shown here in part B. And um, D is a typical adhesion map, and C is an adhesion histogram from this map. All right, so, so what do we find? Well, we find that um, a uh, functionalized tip with a lot of OH bonds on it, we find that seawater has the highest adhesion of the nanoparticle to the rock wall. If we move to brine, which is the salty stuff that's the result of dead bugs and plants and dinosaurs. There's very, very little adhesion. And if we take that same chemical composition for seawater and just add a little bit of calcium, we lower the um, adhesion down to the level of brine, which is what we want because we want the nanoparticles to pass through the reservoir and not stick to the rock wall. So, so then in the middle here, we have the data color-coded and um, with standard deviation error bars. And each one of these points represents um, five of those um, uh, 1032 points uh, adhesion values. And you see consistently the seawater in green is a higher value than the, the brine or the calcium doped seawater. Um, but you might ask, oh, what's going on here? Gosh, this, this one is so much lower here. Um, are there any AFM students in the audience? No? No? Okay. I was going to ask a student to give me the a hypothesis, the reason why that could be. Well, the reason why that could be, at least to my mind, is that we don't have an independent means of checking the chemistry of the tip, right? I can check the chemistry, the, the coating on the, on, the, uh, on the chip part by maybe doing contact angle measurement, but how am I going to check the coating on the, the very tip, 10 nanometers or so? So, so what we did was say, okay, uh, we are using the same tip for all of these fluids. It takes an entire day to do one of these runs. We, we keep the same tip. We don't think we're damaging them. We change the fluids out three times as we, as we change from one fluid to the other and then let the system rest and we recalibrate. Um, 
So if we normalize the data um, to seawater over brine and seawater over calcium doped seawater, then you see that um, all of these ratios are about the same. They're about a factor of two difference. And we're recently doing some molecular dynamics simulations, which um, are that factor of two is consistent with, with the theory. So, so we're quite happy with all of that. And um, so for this first part of the talk, this is what um, uh, the takeaway points are, that uh, oil reservoirs are complex, geometrically, geology, geologically, chemically. Seawater is often used to push oil towards production wells. Engineered nanoparticles can help increase oil recovery, um, but it's not, not, they're just starting to be implemented now. We'd like to understand them better. Adding calcium to seawater lowers the tip, it, AFM tip adhesion to calcite surfaces. And um, I'm looking forward to a field trial of where um, calcium is added to seawater and um, maybe we'll get a higher proportion of nanoparticles through. All right, so that's the underground work. Now let's talk about what happens when you get the stuff out of the ground. Um, so I'm gonna talk about bitumen or asphalt binder and what are its properties, why is it important, and can it be optimized for more durable roads? I, I don't have, I, to be honest, I don't have a answer to that last question, but I'll tell you what we're learning. All right, so, so what is bitumen or asphalt binder? It is the stuff that comes out of the bottom of the oil refinery. Right? So at the top, you get natural gas. In the middle, um, so this is the very light stuff. In the middle, you get various kinds of fuels and, and the <laughs> chemistry for making um, plastics and so forth. And the bitumen is the very, very sticky stuff. Um, thick, viscous stuff for roads and roofs. And if you really have nothing else to do, you can go to the University of Queensland website, the world's longest continuously running experiment. Uh, 90 years ago, someone put pitch, as they call it in um, Australia, Oz, pitch into this funnel, and over 90 years, exactly nine drops of pitch have come out, right? But who knows, you might be the person to see the 10th drop drop. So you're welcome to, log, to go to their website and see how the next drop is, is doing. It's about a drop every 10 years, so I, and I've forgotten what the number for the viscosity is on, on that one. So, um, so it's an interesting material um, because it's, it's fairly complicated. Uh, and then, as you would expect, um, it's pretty well used, uh, about 100 million metric tons per year, mostly for, for roads, also for, for roofs. All right, so our experiments, are to take, well, despite the complexity, um, there you can actually get standard samples. And these standard samples come from the Strategic Highway, Strategic Highway Research Program. And um, the two that were, uh, that I'll tell you about now, they're called Virgin ABD and Virgin AAD. They're from California. And the, uh, they're compl complicated chemically, but you classify all the different uh, chemistries into two groups, either asphaltine or maltine. And the um, two, two standard samples have different asphaltine amounts and different maltine amounts. And we're going to look at them 
with uh, dynamic mode, uh, topo AFM, and, and also record their phase images. So, uh, so what Zhao Kong Yu did, she's now a postdoc at Columbia. Um, she was, uh, had a lot of energy, and she took these two materials, the starting materials we call virgin ABD and virgin AAD, and there's a, a means by which you can separate the isophotenes from the, the maltines. And then if you get enough of that stuff, you can remix them in whatever ratio you want. And, and that's what she did. She separated them into all asphaltines, all maltines, and then remixed them at, at uh, different asphaltine maltine ratios. So, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just principally tell you about ABDs and just mention very quickly AADs. All right, so here's lots of uh, AFM data, topo images on top, uh, phase images on the bottom. And what we didn't really expect, but I think is, is cool, is that these samples change with time. And they change with time over the period of a couple of weeks. This particular type of sample stabilized after uh, two weeks, basically. And um, so you see inclusions, small inclusions at um, two days. We, uh, yeah, Small inclusions at two days that then form this kind of a nice fractal nature and stabilize and then she said, oh, what, what's happening if I take this stuff and I reheat it? And so when you reheat it, then you get something similar to what you started with. And then it's spooky. The, uh, the samples um, start to self-segregate again. So, um, and, and the patterns are almost the same as they were before. Here they look a little bit more. Um, dendral-like. Um, so uh, that is neat, and now I have a better appreciation why there are so many potholes in Worcester, right? My asphalt binder is not staying the same as when, I, uh, when we put it down. Um, so uh, here we show that in the earlier literature before people started using AFM on this material, there were indications um, from differential scanning uh, calorimetry that um, after two weeks um, there were different features. So there were uh, the new data vi clearly visualizing the, the change um, in microstructure is uh, consistent with uh, the older uh, bulk measurements. Right. Um, so, so this one was with 10% asphaltines. Same kind of thing happens with 25% asphaltines, but now by changing the asphaltine concentration, we get different types of features, which is, is also interesting. And uh, it took longer for the features to stabilize, about a month now instead of two weeks. Uh, but as well, they disappear upon heating and then they creep back. And, uh, um, and then uh, here we're trying to be quantitative about um, the appearance of the, mic the microstructures and, and what percentage of, of the images were taken up by the dispersed phase, the, in the inclusions. Right, so they go up and you heat them and they go away and then they come back. Right, um, and then here in this case, now we're looking at the various concentrations, asphaltine 10%, 17%, 25%, 35%, 50 And we, uh, this is all six days after making the samples. And uh, what I think is really neat is that in um, the lower asphaltine amounts, um, the uh, inclusions are recessed. And you get up to 25% asphaltines and then they pop out at you. And um, then they become smaller and smaller. 
So um, what's, what's going on with that? Well, uh, when we do rheology and look at the um, la, uh, storage and loss modulus, 25% asphaltines corresponds to where the, um, the two have the same value and they, they cross over. All right, so um, for, for the above ground work, um, what we've shown is that uh, the evolution and morphology of microstructures uh, depend both on time and also on composition. Um, the higher asphaltine uh, concentrations, they took longer to stabilize. Um, the development of the microstructures structures agrees well with um, steric hardening behavior reported in the previous literature. And we're now looking at our own rheology data um, that was not reported in that uh, paper, uh, figures from the paper that uh, I just showed you. Um, and then we'll, we have those data and we'll be able to uh, see what our data say about that. So. Um, what have, been, have I been talking about? Well, I've been talking about um, polymers uh, underground, um, the organic matter in, in shale, and how can you more efficiently extract um, using nanoparticles and understanding the, the chemistry of um, how nano, the coatings of nanoparticles behave in different fluids. And then uh, above ground, we've got uh, the, uh, the bitumen and the hope that we can someday uh, run either our, our tootsies or our tires on, on roads that are pothole free. And as a summary, I'll do a, a visual summary for you um, and a, a course in the amount of time, I've just given you a, a very superficial overview of the last couple of years of work, um, but I'm happy to, to take further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So questions? Uh, please. Oh, here? So if you look at the, at, at the growth of this stuff on the couple weeks time scale, yeah. can you put a number on the mass flow and what kind of diffusion cost I this is exactly the, the, the direction I'd love, love to go um, in terms, and I'm repeating your words for the purposes of uh, yeah, mass, mass flow and diffusion constants on, 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 on this. Yeah, we'd, I'd love to have the time and personnel to look into that. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know what's happening inside the, the drop. Yeah, um, inside the drop, things could be coming, you know, more segregated or, or not. Uh, yeah. But those two seem disconnected in your brain. Um, it, it, yes, so the, the um, uh, I'm glad we didn't have to wait 10 years to, <laughs> to see the, the samples evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Long-term funding there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, poor PhD students. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Song and then one more. Yes. So you, you mentioned that the sample you heat up and let it cool down. Yes. So is it the speed of cooling uh, change? <coughs> yeah. Good question. Um, uh, we didn't have time to investigate that, but other researchers have done flash freezing, and uh, but that was in the not in the context of AFM. So. Um, you know, more graduate students. There would still, you know, this this is an area where there's so much to do that, you know, I could have a whole team of graduate students and have quest good questions for all of them. Yes. So for, for the, uh, the time evolution of the asphaltines, uh, were you imaging the same area? And uh, no, um, no, it's not the same area um, because there's, uh, when you're, you're imaging 20 by 20 microns, it's really hard to come back, you know, the next way, day if you bring the sample out and then put it back in. Um, but I think we have enough statistics and there's enough um, uniformity in, in where you go on the sample 
that what we showed you is pretty representative. Yep. But um, yeah, if we had a whole instrument to ourselves, it'd be great to you know to book it for two weeks and take a picture every hour or something like that. So if you watched the one of them, would you see it grow? Yes. Yes. Okay. And become more fractal and snowflake-like, and then you could. Um, well, what she uh, what she found is that um, different mixtures uh, stabilized after different time periods. So the ten percent asphaltine uh, took um, two weeks, and the twenty five or seventeen, the higher asphaltine took almost a month to stabilize. Okay, let's... Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I, hmm. I didn't show you this one during the talk, hmm. but I meant, um, so we concentrated on this one. This is the standard kind of sample called ABD. This is the standard sample called AAD. And this, I'm a physicist, and, and so I actually um, have a lot of fun with this one, because if you take cross-section of one of these, it looks like this, and that's like, ooh, a wave packet in quantum mechanics, right? So, so um, but we only had so much time, so I didn't show uh -huh. that to you. Uh -huh. Looks like lamella. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So with that, like to, we'd like to thank Nancy again.